Elliot Smith is one of the most reluctant rock and folk artists that gained fame in the 90s and early 2000s. He gained his breakthrough in pop culture with his song Miss Misery because it was featured in the critically acclaimed movie Good Will Hunting and also because the song was nominated for an Oscar in the Best Original Song category in 1998. But despite of gaining fame, Elliot struggled with depression and eventually drugs. His tough upbringing left him with some very heavy emotional baggage, which he never really recovered from. But no matter how tough his life was, he kept on making beautiful music till the end of his days. So let's take a closer look. Elliot Smith was born Stephen Paul Smith in Omaha, Nebraska in 1969 as the only child of Gary Smith and Bunny K. Berryman. When he was only six months old, his parents divorced and he stayed with his mother. As time went on, his mother developed a relationship with Charlie Welch, a man that, according to Elliot, may have been sexually abusing him by a young age. Jennifer Chiba was Elliot's last partner before he died, and in an interview she explained that he was remembering traumatic things from his childhood, parts of things. It's not my place to say what. Some people theorize that it's because of these traumatic memories that Elliot eventually resorted to drug abuse. Now, back to his childhood. When he was nine, Elliot started learning to play the piano, and later tried his hands on the guitar. It was around this time that he also composed a piano piece called Fantasy for a school competition and won. None of his family members were professional musicians from before, but some of his mother's relatives did play music as a hobby. Now, in his early teens, he moved to his father in Portland, Oregon, and became more ambitious with creating his own music. It was here that he met Tony Lash, a fellow Rush fan that he became close friends with. Tony and Elliot decided to start a band together with their friends Jason and Garrick, and call themselves Stranger Than Fiction. Tony initially had the role as their producer, but eventually stepped in as their drummer too, and together they created four tapes. Later, he formed the group Harem Scarum, which basically was the same four guys as in Stranger Fiction, just with a slightly different sound. But it wasn't just his band that went through changes at the time. After graduation, Smith began calling himself Elliot, saying that he thought Steve sounded too much like a jock, and that Steven sounded too bookish. The newly named Elliot Smith later went to Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts, where he studied philosophy and political science. It seemed like his four years of studying here was a double-edged sword. He both enjoyed and disliked doing it because he wasn't aware of anything better to do. Like he said himself, this is your one and only chance to go to college and you'd just better do it because someday you might wish that you did. Everybody's second home, always trying to get me alone. While in Hampshire, Smith formed the band Heatmeister with vocalist and guitarist Neil Gust, bassist Brand Peterson, who was later replaced by Sam Coombs, and his old Stranger Than Fiction drummer Tony Lash. The band began playing in Portland venues around 92, and the group released the albums Dead Ear in 93, Cop and Speeder in 94, as well as the Yellow No. 5 EP in 94 on Frontier Records. They then signed to Virgin Records to release what became their final album, Mix City Sons, in 96. While being in Heapmeister, Elliot and Neil would take on several odd temporary jobs around Portland. They did everything from transplanting bamboo trees to installing drywalls. But Elliot wasn't completely satisfied with being a member of Heapmeister at this point. As his friend Tony Lash once said, Having his songs go through the Heapmeister process was having them come out at the other end in ways that he didn't necessarily want. Because of this, Elliot decided to start a career as a solo artist. His debut album, Roman Candle, was released through Cavity Search Records in 94 and was notable for its lo-fi, homemade quality. Surely enough, it sounded like this because it was recorded in his girlfriend's basement on a 4-track recorder. Everyone is gone. Now, his self-titled sophomore album was released the next year with a very similar sound. 
it's just Elliot singing with his guitar, and occasionally you can hear drums and harmonica in the background. It's very simplistic music, simplistic folk and pop. But the album that most people associate with the name Elliot Smith is probably either or. It was this album that highly impressed director Gus Van Sant, whom incorporated three of its songs, along with new Elliot Smith material, into the Goodwill Hunting soundtrack, propelling Smith into the international spotlight. It was this film feature, along with his performance at the Oscars in 98, that made him famous outside of Portland and the US. About the performance, Elliot said, The Oscars was a very strange show where the set was only one song cut down to less than two minutes, and the audience was a lot of people who didn't come to hear me play. I wouldn't want to live in that world, but it was fun to walk around on the moon for a day. The fact that Elliot went to the Oscars was a huge win for the people that were into folk and indie music at that time. This subculture in music suddenly had a voice that reached far into the rest of the world. It was an event that made both Elliot and his fans proud. But the negative thing for Elliot in this case was that he had to do a lot more interviews and shows, which he didn't really enjoy that much. The two things that Elliot loved to do was to write music and record it. And he told the people that he worked with that he was willing to play shows and do interviews only so that he could do more writing and recording. Elliot's fourth studio album, XO, was released in 98 after he had ended his term with the record label Kill Rock Stars and signed to DreamWorks. Compared to his previous albums, this one has a larger arrangement of instruments. Elliot plays the usual guitar, piano, bass, and drums, but also adds organ, mandolin, electronic, piano, melodica, percussion, string, and horn arrangements to the mix as well. Paul Polverenti, one of Elliot's touring musicians during the XO tour, said that at the first day of tour he showed up and he was wearing this hat. Touring was really fun, it was like one big happy family. But sadly enough, things weren't always like this. Elliot was known for sometimes drinking far too much, and he would have these really depressive mood swings where he even considered suicide. People around him started noticing it and brought it up in conversation, something Elliot didn't like at all, as he would only become more angry with those people. Now, his last record, Figure 8, was released in 2000 and was described by the man himself as a more fragmented and dreamlike record. Some songs have been noted by critics to be more positive and up-tempo compared to his previous work. Around the time he began recording his final album, Smith began to display signs of paranoia, often believing that a white van followed him wherever he went. He would continuously ask his friends to drop him off a mile from studio on his way to a session so that people wouldn't find him. In an interview, Elliot notably said, Not long ago, my house was broken into and songs were stolen off my computer, which I wound up in the hands of certain people who work at a certain label. I've also been followed around for months at a time, I wouldn't even want to necessarily say it's the people from that label who are following me around, but it was probably them who broke into my house. During this period, he also had uneven eating and sleeping habits. Sometimes he would go days without sleeping and then sleep for an entire day. He also began to distance himself from the people he worked with, his manager, his session musicians and his producer, especially his producer Rob Schnapp since he confronted Elliot about his drug issues. The executives at DreamWorks scheduled meetings with Elliot to try to figure out what had gone wrong. Elliot had accordingly said that his personal life had been intruded and that there wasn't enough promotion for his previous record. Because of this, he wanted to opt out of his record contract, and if they didn't let him do so, he claimed that he would take his own life. After undergoing this very heavy period, Elliot attempted to go back to the studio to finish up the album he was currently working on, but with the help of David McConnell instead of Schnapp. But Elliot's return to the studio only cranked up 
his problem even more. According to McConnell, he was smoking over $1,500 worth of heroin every day, was numerous times trying to overdose, and oftentimes talked about death. Now, later on, on one of his performances at the Crystal Ballroom in Portland in December of 2001, the reviewer of the show expressed concerns for Elliot. His hair was greasy and long, his face was bearded and gaunt, and he would several times forget lyrics and the chords for the songs he was playing. Things seemingly moved in the right direction again a couple of years later when he decided to cut out alcohol, coffee, and red meat, refined sugars, and his psychiatric medications. Director Mike Mills, who was working with him on a film at this point, said, I gave the script to him, then he dropped off the face of the earth. He went through this whole crazy time, but by the time I was done with the film, he was making from a basement on the hill, and I was shocked that he was actually making music. In the second half of 2003, he interestingly enough started experimenting with noise music. He started learning to record music on an iMac and lived with his girlfriend Jennifer Chiba in Echo Park, California. But sadly enough, on October 21st of 2003, he died at the age of 34 from two stab wounds to the chest. According to his girlfriend, they were arguing when she decided to lock herself in the bathroom and take a shower. She heard a scream, opened the door, and saw him with a knife in his chest. Jennifer immediately called 911, but it was too late as he died later that afternoon. Except for the prescribed medication present at normal levels in his blood, no drugs were found in his system, and the coroner could not confirm whether the stabs were self-inflicted or caused by someone else, so till this day, the report remains undetermined. Sean Goldenboy Sullivan, one of Elliot's touring musicians, said that I kind of felt like a lot of the complexity of who he was got erased after he was gone, because people wanted an easy way to understand him. After he died, people got the chance to label him as this depressed, lonely drug addict. But this was just the tip of the iceberg, he was so much more than that. He used to be a class clown, he made character studies in his lyrics, really cared about his fans, and always wanted to help people out. He loved to read novels, religion, and philosophy, but even more than that, he loved writing his own music. He was a very polarizing character for sure, and I think that's the most interesting part about him. You can never really understand him completely. Drink up, baby. Stay up all night. Thank you so much for watching this video. I just want to spend a short moment thanking these people over at Patreon. These guys actually make it more possible for me to make better videos. So if you want to help me make rock music more meaningful for other people as well, then make sure you hit the first link in the description below and it will take you over to Patreon. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.